Thanks for dialing into the All Together Show. I'm your host, Eric Satz. And this week, we're joined by the person I refer to as the most interesting woman in the world, Mona Sutphin. She's the former White House Deputy Chief of Staff. She's a current director on the Spotify board. She's been an acting senior advisor to the Vista Group in Chicago. And she's also managed to co-found several technology startups and author The Next American Century. Mona, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. Great to be with you. Great to have you here. I've been looking forward to this for some time. So, you know, I really have to start with, uh, because uh, your, your brother and I went to college together and we're very close friends, close enough for him to be in the, in the wedding. Um, yeah. I need to know, of all of his friends, not named Jonathan, who is your favorite? Who is your favorite of his friends? Well, obviously the answer is Eric Sass. There you go. I love it. All ding, right. Ding, ding. I got the right answer, right? You got the right answer. So look, I, I say the most interesting woman in the world because you've been a foreign service officer in the Clinton administration. You're on the staff of the National Security Council. Uh, you are a managing director at Stonebridge International. You've been deputy chief of staff to the White House. Uh, you're on the board of Spotify. You've been the author of a book about China and India. But in your own words, can you tell us who Mona Sutphin is? Sure. Uh, so as you can tell from that description, Mona Sutphin is someone who is intellectually curious always up for a little adventure, always seeking interesting spaces that challenge assumptions about what is known and what is believed to be true. And at the core, really believes in public service and public policy and the need to give back to community. And then I'm a mom. There's All right, but let's go back before you be before you became a mom. You were you you were born to parents where? Born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Good mes Midwestern stock. That's where I was born and raised. I spent my whole life there until going to college. Can you can you tell me about your mom and dad and and what what was life like growing up? What uh were were there more formative moments than others? Yeah, so my parents were uh, on the hippie end of the, of the political spectrum. Um, my mother, white Jewish American, my father, African American. They got married in 1960 in Kansas City, Kansas, because they were living in Kansas City, Missouri, and it was still illegal for blacks and whites to get married in 1960. So they wow. went on their lunch break and walked across the bridge to Kansas City, Kansas to get married. He worked for the National Labor Relations Board. My mom worked for the Juvenile Public Defender. Um, we moved to a community that was incredibly diverse and incredibly liberal. Um, so I thought growing up in Milwaukee in the 1970s that it was completely normal to have multiple multiracial couples, people with adopted kids, running around all kinds of LGBTQ partners, we thought that was completely normal and that every single neighborhood in America was structured that exact same way. Um, and needless to say, as you get out into the world, you realize that maybe that isn't actually the norm at all, but it was great upbringing. Um, and my parents always uh, were, were involved in public community at the local level. So we always had people running through the house who were running for something. We were always hosting events for people running for office. We were involved in a bunch of community organizations and all, all the like. So at, at what point do you come to understand, realize that this community in Milwaukee that you live in is not reality everywhere else? Yeah. That's easy. The uh, 1980, when Ronald Reagan got elected, and I remember asking my mom how it was possible because there were no Republicans. <laughs> and she laughed and said, no, you don't know any Republicans. But actually, there are a lot of Republicans. 
<laughs> and I thought that was a completely shocker to me. I just found it totally stunning. And I realized um, later when I went to college, got out, went to college, I realized, oh, wow, there's a whole different world out here. But living in our little cul-de-sac, we thought it was just this little idyllic uh, black and brown, white, black and brown community with everybody running around singing Kumbaya, literally. So, Where, where was college? I went to Mount Holyoke College in Western Mass down the road from you. And uh, uh, yes, down the road from Amherst. Nice part of town. Well, yep. uh, why Mount Holyoke? Mm -hmm. So I had a very strong desire to, to leave Wisconsin. So that was my main number one priority in thinking about college. Um, I went to a large public high school. Uh, where at the time, if you graduated in the top 10% of your class, you automatically got into college, University of Wisconsin system. So when I showed up thinking that I wanted to go to school elsewhere, people kept on wondering, well, why, why would you do that? You don't even have to do anything. You can go to University of Wisconsin. Why bother? Um, and I had this very strong desire to, to get out into the world. And so my father uh, had a, a law intern who had gone to Mount Holyoke, and she offered to write me a letter. That is the main reason why I ended up at Mount Holyoke College. That was literally the extent of it. Um, my high school had no college advising office. When I went in to say I had to take this exam called the SAT, nobody had taken it. Nobody even knew where to take it. Um, <laughs> it wasn't even a thing. <laughs> and so that was kind of the, the most people did not go on to college. I think only um, 30 students in my class of about 350 went to college and only two of us left the state of Wisconsin. So um, it was quite a, a abnormality for me to head out. So, so as you know, Alto is about investing in your financial future and hopefully creating some financial flexibility or freedom as we get towards what historically has been referred to as our retirement years. Was applying to Holyoke and paying for a Holyoke the the first real exposure to um, uh, finance for you, or how how did that work? So I'd say that my my parents were not super. Obviously, they were public servants. They weren't super financially sophisticated, but my mother always used to stress how important it was to be financially literate and to be financially independent as a woman. She thought that that was the highest priority thing. Um, and that financial flexibility gave you genuine freedom to make choices in life. So that was really embedded super early on. Um, and yes, Mount Holyoke was the first time that I realized the, the cost of education, this idea that you would be investing in this four-year experience and my parents willing to put a lot on the line in order for me and David to be able to go to college and the sacrifices associated with that, how significant that was for their financial existence. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say, but I, I had an orientation. It was something that was of interest even before that. So. Yeah, so that, that's super helpful to understand. So what did you, what did you study at Holyoke? So I studied international relations and Asian studies. So where, where do you go from Holyoke? Do you go directly into public service or is there a stop in between? Yeah, so I had a stop in between. Um, my uh, college advisor uh, was a guy, Tony Lake, who later became national security advisor. And I was his research assistant. And I studied international affairs. And when I was a senior, he encouraged me to take the foreign service exam. And I had no interest in public policy at all whatsoever. I was interested in advertising. I was interested in the film business. I did not want to follow in my parents' footsteps in any way, shape, or form. But <laughs> I couldn't quite come up with arguments about why I should resist taking an exam that was free, that didn't require any preparation. So I caved and took, took the exam. And the way the foreign service exam worked back then, at least, I'm not sure how it works now, you take the exam and then you, you don't hear from anybody for, for a long, long time. So you, you make career decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So I went into advertising when I, when I graduated from, from college, I went to Leo Burnett in Chicago. Yeah. Um, I worked on the Procter and Gamble account 
I bought and sold ad time in Midwestern markets, including Milwaukee, uh, not shockingly. And I'll, my, my way station into public policy was um, one night I was working on the ad buy, the upfront ad buy, and I had an Excel spreadsheet and I accidentally deleted the column with the formulas in it. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I had to piece together from an earlier printed copy to go back and try to figure out what I had done. And I remember sitting there at three o'clock in the morning saying to myself, there has to be more to life than um, selling shampoo. There just has to be. And so um, literally, I think the next couple of weeks, I got a call from the Foreign Service that I had passed the Foreign Service exam that I'd kind of forgotten about, to be honest. So right. um so that's that was my that was my story about how I ended up in the Foreign Service. And you know, I, I I think to most of us, certainly to me, and I imagine most of the listeners out there, uh the Foreign Service is it is a mystery, much less you know, the National Security Council. Can you tell us a little bit? Because you were you were in the Foreign Service for a long time. Can you, yeah, can you tell us about that experience and, and what that means and what your job is, what the objective may be? Yeah, sure. So um, so the goal of a, of, a, of a diplomat is essentially to convince uh, wherever you're stationed overseas to try to convince your partners and your allies or your foes to see it your way, essentially. And you really have nothing... <laughs> no real resources to convince people other than um, the political will and your ability to sway people with good arguments, right? It's not like we're showering people with tons of money, although we obviously the government does do that in some circumstances. Um, but as a junior officer, which I was, you're basically going into uh, a foreign ministry in another country and trying to convince a government to go along with what you think the solutions are to whatever problem it is that has crept up on the global stage. And so it teaches you um, how to listen for nuances and motivations of people to try to figure out angles of how to connect with people so that you can find common ground. You're forced to interact with lots of different people and observe politics in a foreign context, which you may not fully understand. So it turns out those skills are actually pretty help, helpful in life generally, how to read a situation. Um, and so it, it's perfect for somebody like me, as you've noticed, I like to hop around a lot because it looks like you have one job, but in fact, every two years you move from job to job to job. So I started off in Thailand. Um, I worked uh, in the consular division there doing issuing visas for Thai citizens who want to visit the United States, which is great for language skills and all the rest of it. Um, but I also covered, as a political officer, I covered the pro-democracy movement in Burma. Um, we hadn't normalized relations with Vietnam yet, so we were still traveling to Vietnam to do that. Um, really interesting experience. And I covered, because I covered the human rights portfolio, ended up back in the department doing human rights policy. Then I ended up in the Balkans working on post-implementation of the Dayton Peace Accords. And then the, um, and then I went on from there to the to uh, get a graduate degree at London School of Economics and then the UN and then the White House. So it's you're you get to move around quite a bit. You work on completely different issues over your 10 years. Um, and every time you bid on a new job, you can go anywhere in the world. So and people bounce everywhere in the world. You do not stay in one place. Right. So you may be an Arabic speaker, but you did not spend your whole career there. You might bounce into four or five different regions over your life, over your career. Um, and and by the way, this is going to help me connect the dots to a couple of different things. But I immediately want to go to the next American century, how the how the U.S. can thrive as other powers rise, because I I think there are a few things more topical than uh, China right now. Mm -hmm. And so, what what can you tell us about what? motivated you to to write this book and how is it applicable to what we're seeing unfold on the world stage at the moment? Yeah. So my um when I worked at the National Security Council, my um one of my dearest friends and colleagues, Nina Hachigian, uh, and I shared a little teeny tiny cubby office together. And needless to say, when you're spending 20 hours a day in a little, little teeny tiny office, you either end up hating each other, you end up being fast friends. So we've been colleagues and friends for life. Um, and she and I 
uh, worked on a couple of potential writing projects together, including a movie screenplay that ended up not going very far. Um, but she called me one day and said, I have an idea for a writing project for a book. And I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm not sure if we necessarily want to go down that path. But we both had noticed for some time with the rise of China, we both had young kids. We had noticed this drumbeat where suddenly colleagues and peers of ours were suddenly articulating very clearly that they were somehow worried that their kids would not have economic opportunity because of China's rise. What's going to happen in the future? China's going to have all the jobs. What are my kids going to do? Like, how is the economy going to evolve? And Nina and I, we both spent a lot of time in Asia. She had been at China, studied China, um, the development of the internet there. I'd studied Chinese in college. We both understood how China fit into the global, uh, to the global system. And we were both really shocked that that was the reaction from friends of ours. And so the book was really uh, written from a perspective. It was not a foreign policy book. It was written for a general audience to make the argument that um, the biggest problems that the world faces, climate change, terrorism, those kinds of things, require strong governments to work together. And the impulse to compete with another rising power is very, very strongly rooted in American culture, natural, nationalism, and all the rest of it. But it's actually counterproductive because the, the things that would wipe us off the planet, like a pandemic, which we wrote about explicitly, by the way, or terrorist uh, threats, which we wrote about explicitly, um, all of those kinds of threats, you actually really need collaborative partners. And you need partners with a lot of heft um, because you can't solve all these problems by yourself, right? They're global and they require leadership. Um, so we've just felt really passionately about that, that this is we people needed to understand the difference between having competition, which is fine, and the difference between existential threats. Um, and we, the two have gotten conflated. So needless to say, people didn't really listen to our book because we're now busy <laughs> headed on a collision course with China. <laughs> yeah, And we still haven't done a very good job of dealing with our global threats. Um, hence this global pandemic where some of the worst vectors are coming out of the developing world and nobody can agree on how to get vaccine to people, right? So we haven't, or the refugee crisis, which we haven't figured out what to do about. It, it, it sounds like, and I don't know if you would agree or disagree with this statement, but really the only zero sum game here is if we don't work together to combat terrorism or pandemics or climate change. It's, it, it's not that uh, we do better and China does worse or China does better and, and we do worse. Those, those things don't have to be a zero-sum game. Would you, it, would you agree or disagree with that? Yeah. That was actually our, our, one of our central arguments is that when you have countries that have wealth and are doing have, have leadership uh, potential who are investing in um, ecosystems that have innovative R&D, if a Chinese researcher comes up with a, how to um, treat cancer, um, how to solve the cancer problem or, or solve any other kind of global problem, that's like a net good thing for the world, right? Right. Now, obviously, the competition of who's going to get there first actually sets, is, is a fantastic motivator because that's actually motivates people to make investments, to continue investing in the economies, to continue to educate people. That's all good. So the competition is good. But the idea that somehow the net effect of China being successful, China having more engineers, the people who say, oh my God, China's producing all these engineers. It's like, yeah, because they have a billion people. Of course, they're going to have more engineers than we have. <laughs> they should have more engineers than we have. The right. question is, Who's got, do we still have the best engineers? Just because they have engineers doesn't mean we don't have engineers. We just, it means we need to produce more engineers, right? Those two things have nothing to do with each other. So yeah, so there's a quite zero sum mentality, but it's not zero sum in most cases, unless you let it go there, right? Then it right. can start to feel like it's zero sum. So you, you, when you were describing your experience uh, in the Foreign Service, you, you said a number of things about understanding nuance and reading a room and understanding, uh, uh, let, let's just say, a mood or attitude that that may exist in another land and this, uh, this desire to either um, 
influence them in a way to do something that they otherwise don't think they want to do or to simply get them to maybe support uh, the United States in a way that they hadn't thought about supporting us previously. Can you talk about that experience and how it relates to your role as a board member? Yeah, sure. So um, I'd say the, the, the most relevant parallel is like any decision-making body, different people have different levels of power, different levels of influence. And in a political context, if you're in a negotiation, let's say, with, let's say at the end of the Balkan War, you have lots of different people with in different incentives that are coming at a conversation with a different objective. And in order for you to navigate through that, you really need to understand what is this person trying to achieve? What is it that's motivating them? And what's their end goal here? Because you need to figure out, is this a friend or foe? Are we basically trying to do the same thing? Are they actually, when we, if you play it all the way through your mind, actually we're an opposing, it may sound like we're on the same page, but we're really not. And when we get down to the very end of it, we're going to be in opposite places. Um, I'd say governance work and board work is, is similar in that you're often dealing with novel kind of strategic challenges. People have very different views about where to take things. They're coming from different perspectives entirely. Um, and it, and it requires you to have a sense of what, where, where is their give and where is their room to move things along toward whatever a good outcome is. You have to make your arguments to other people. You have to be influential, win the day, win the argument and that kind of thing. So it's very similar. I'd say it's similar for the work world period. It's not just board governance, anything. You're trying to do a financial, you're trying to do a transaction and close a deal, right? You got to like, what is it that this other person, I have to convince this other person to come along my way. Some of it is the, the facts, but a lot of it is just what, what's in that person's mind. What do they need to hear that's going to convince them that this is the right thing to do? Is, it, is that a mix of logic and passion uh, as well as maybe taking potentially at times extreme positions or in your experience, do you think you need to leave the passion out of it? And really, just rely on the logic and not put uh, not put stakes in the ground. Well, it depends on what the. It depends on that's part of reading the the situation. Sometimes your interlocutor, you do have to stake out firm ground because you can see this is going to be a negotiation where we start on opposite sides. And so we're going to move. If you if you start off too, you've given too much when you start. You're never going to meet in the middle. Because you can tell already that's we're pitted against each other and we're moving toward the middle. In other situations, you're it's a little bit more nuanced and you're you realize that the the best arguments can kind of win the day. So your your task is just to articulate that information in a way that is um, that other people can absorb and that you ultimately can see eye to eye on the same fact base and that the decision is naturally going to come out that way. Uh, that's a lot of personality driven because sometimes you're in situations as, all the time in government where it should be a logic train and it isn't. And other times when you're thinking there's no way this is going to be driven by logic and reason. And in fact, it really actually is. So I'd say personality reading the individuals is 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 very paramount. And some of it's ego, so, like how much are you are you playing in or against somebody else's ego in the in the room? So that the, the, I mean, that's a very interesting last statement. And uh, feel feel free to say, well, you, you'll know how to how to handle this next one because not only is China very topical on which you've written, Spotify at the moment is incredibly topical. Uh, yeah. Is it? Has that been a difficult um, position for you, for the board? Uh, how, how do you weigh? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I don't even know what the question is. How, how, how do you weigh <laughs> the pros and cons of the current situation? Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging environment, obviously, as any of the platforms have. And I think Daniel's spoken really eloquently about this, about the need to try to draw lines in an area that's intentionally gray. Um, 
And there's no real easy, perfect solution. I mean, Obama used to say all the time, um, you know, if it was an easy decision, like it would have been made a long time ago and we wouldn't be talking about this, right? So it's like somebody else would have taken the credit like six weeks ago and it wouldn't, wouldn't rise to that to that uh, level. So um, I, I think it's just the norm of dealing in a really, really um, complicated, fast moving, changing set of expectations and norms. Um, and it's not just, that's not just a Spotify thing. It's true for every single corporation in America, I think is struggling with all kind, all similar kinds of issues. I see it on all of the, everything I'm involved in, portfolio company or otherwise. So, you know, the, po politics aside, right, left, right, center, whatever it may be, I, I think most people would agree that both President Clinton and President Obama were just super smart, thoughtful individuals. Can you, you work closely with both. Can you draw a line between the two in terms of how they thought about things, how they analyzed things, how they made decisions? Yeah. Um, obviously, very different personality wise, as you, you know, it's, it's like a, a the key thing that always people would always say is Clinton was notoriously chronically late and Obama is very disciplined about time. And so, so their personal style is very different. But I would say they had a, a both of them had a skill set that I've rarely seen in in people, period, in life, which is the ability to compartmentalize, to go deep and compartmentalize information and move seamlessly from issue to issue and be get to that really central core decision that's being made um, where the rubber is really hitting the road and be able to very quickly get to that the actual trade-off that you're making when you're making a decision. And there are many instances where I saw, I would say, like, I just cannot believe that you remember the nuances of a conversation that we had on a policy topic that's somewhat Byzantine from six months ago and be able to pick it up again, like you literally just put the paper down on the, on the table and, and be able to isolate the exact bit of the conversation where something important was happening. And not because somebody said it was important, because you understood it enough to realize like, no, 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 that's not the issue. This over here is the issue. And I've never actually seen anybody else do it as well as either of them, although their style is obviously very, very different. Um, but I was always tremendously impressed by that um, ability to just retain all of that and understand what was important at any given moment. That That's really interesting. So obviously there's a tremendous amount of polarization in Congress today. Is it the worst it's ever been? Or is it just a uh, a different level of access that that we can see how bad it can be at times relative to 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 100 years ago. Yeah, so I'd say it's both, both and, right? So it is um, not the worst it's ever been, obviously, because we had a civil war and we've had, you know, we've had really, really bad with this series of assassinations and other things in the country that have been cataclysmic for the... Um, the body politic. But I'd say we're in, I think, one of the more dangerous moments in the country. Um, because we, I, I, I think this is true, that we may be the first country that is actually changed its demographics in a profound way inside the country. There have been lots of countries, South Africa and others, where the politics have changed. But the demographics of the country haven't changed. We're in a situation where actually who makes up this country is, is, is changing in a very, very profound way. And it's a scary thing for lots of people because it's, it's profoundly different than what people were assuming life would be like uh, when they were younger or what they expected for their kids, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as we all know, change is really hard and it can be scary and people are trying to find their place culturally or otherwise. And along comes technology that allows um for the amplification and um, really weaponization of, of those, those feelings of angst that were always there. Any period of change in the United States 
you've had this angst and we've had terrible moments in our history where we look back and said, oh, I can't believe that. The idea that we were in inter- interning, you know, Japanese in camps, right? Now people think like, why did we ever do that? We've, we've done tons of things that are, that now look like they were beyond the pale. Um, and people get swept up quite, quite quickly. So I feel like the country is coming to um, a fork in the road that's been coming for a very long time because the nature of the economy the nature of the demographic change is is here. It's real time. Um, I would say the most powerful, most influential demographic in the United States is a 22 year old Latina because that's who's making buying decisions in in the United States, and we're we're a capitalist economy, right? And so in America, the buck always wins at the end of the day, right? That's that's the system that we have, and we're in this situation where um, there's just a lot of uh, jockeying for power in in the system as it's currently constructed, and it's a it's a really dangerous moment. So, so, I, so I worry about it a lot. No, I'm sorry. Say that again. I say I worry about it a lot because um, people aren't ready. For, you have lots of people who feel on on the left and the right um, that this is a life or death moment. And whether we like it or not, they're dragging yeah. everybody else into it. You know what I mean? So whether you want to there to be there or not, or you're happy with your life, it, it may not matter so much, right? Uh, I I agree. I am also concerned. Um, you brought up a capitalist society. You know, what, I, what I what I want to ask you about, I should ask you, which is what I worry about the most is that um, I think the vast majority of Americans are concerned. And people feel increasingly powerless to do anything about it, which is a terrible commentary on the state of our democracy and society that um, because the consent of the governed obviously is a key part of our um, of our system. So. Cannot agree more. In a um, boy, that really put a damper on the mood, Mona. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in, in, uh, we, we do like to talk about finance and, and capitalism. Yeah, let's do have it. You, have, have you given any thought to the rules regulating slash governing personal investments, meaning – for most people, for most private company opportunities and other similar opportunities, you have to be an accredited investor, which means you have to have a certain level of net worth or net income to participate in an offering, which seems to to be a very uh, paternalistic approach that Congress has taken under what I will say is a story of protectionism. We we need we need to we need to protect the people from themselves, which I take issue with. Have you ha, have you thought about this at all? Should should more people have access to the same investment opportunities given today's investment climate, where companies are staying private longer and longer? Yeah, I mean, there's no question to me that this is many, many places in our financial architecture that are tilted toward those who already have means. This is perhaps one of the most important ones because private the private equity and private assets have become such a larger proportion of how people invest their money. It's become more of a of a gating issue, right? If, if in the public markets, um, you know, mutual fund is a way your average person can gain access, et cetera, et cetera. But if all the returns are in private assets, then you're by definition cutting a huge swath of the population out of ever seeing that upside. And it's it's incredibly unfair, right, to say um because you have a certain income, it implies that you're not intelligent is essentially what it's what it's saying. Because the investor protection is to protect people, understandably, right, who don't understand what they're getting themselves into and can be scammed, et cetera, et cetera. But for in our system, we equate money with wisdom. And that's, an, I think, an unfair and uh, illegitimate kind of connection. And it's it's a lazy connection. 
Um, uh, and I, so I think that, you know, the challenge is for everybody who thinks like this is an important thing to unlock is how do you do it in a way where you get genuine, not just the check in the box like we have on the forms <laughs> when you're in the yeah. public markets. Like, yes, I understand there is some taking. You don't even look at the two font uh, writing, but actually the people understand what the what the risks are. Right. And um, I think there'll be a lot of innovation in this space, for example, where. And I think in the end, maybe we'll get there where private equity funds open up, for example, a pool of capital for individuals, for retail investors. So they're not making those individual decisions, but they're capped on how much access they can have, right, in terms of just dollar amount of their overall net worth or whatever, things like that. So No, I, I, I agree with that approach. And actually, Jay Clayton will be on the show next week. Uh, okay. And I look forward. To, I, I look forward to discuss. For those who don't know, Jay is the former SEC commissioner, but I look forward to discussing that uh, exact issue with him among among others. But to, to your point, money does not beget intelligence or wisdom, whereas intelligence or wisdom may beget money or net worth or net income. And I think we've got it backwards. So yeah, um, uh, agree more. You, you you know one of the God, so many things that you're involved in are, are topical. We we covered China. We talked about Spotify a little bit. Let's talk about crypto. Yeah, let's talk about it. Because <laughs> you and I have been talking about crypto for a long time now. Right. Where, where are you involved? How are you involved? What do you think the, the future is from uh, a governmental uh, regulatory standpoint in terms of stable coins or government's own, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies? Yeah. So uh, I think, you know, I've got involved. I've been involved, yeah, in the crypto landscape for now probably 10 years or so. Um, but in the last couple of years, I was part of the founding team of a DeFi trading pro protocol called Hashflow, which is a um, non-automatic -automa market maker uh, trading protocol. And um, so I've been watching the evolution of this business, this whole segment for a while. I've felt for a very long time that DeFi is the real innovation here that is going to fundamentally transform financial services. Um, I've been pleased and interested to watch how the debate has evolved from, um, we hate it, let's kill it to, oh, we can't kill it to, oh, let's regulate it and do this to, oh, we can't do that either to finally, I would say, and I, I always thought that actually the Biden people, and this has proven to be true, would have the wherewithal and interest in going relatively deep to try to actually understand it. And I think, a very, very important thing has happened in the last year and a half or so um, that I'd like to take some credit for, but other people take a lot more credit than me, uh, which is to, to make the case in the national security establishment that um, crypto and DeFi in particular are essential to maintaining the primacy of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. And I say that turn in mindset is starting to be revealed in the way people are starting to talk about it. So it's a very profoundly important moment in how people think about this entire ecosystem. But as you know, we are in maybe the first inning, maybe the second inning. And if you told me that every single thing that everybody knows to be today in the crypto world, if none of it existed in 10 years, I would not be at all shocked. <laughs> Just like, you know what I mean? With like half the internet stuff from the early days, people aren't using anymore either. Um, so it's a fascinating, fascinating moment. And on the regulatory front, um, you know, we went from that soupy stew. There's always tons of regulatory lack of clarity in almost every asset class and almost every area. There's always overlapping regulators, energy, financial services, food, you name it. So for people who are always saying, well, why can't there just be one regulatory regime? I'm like, yeah, welcome to America. <laughs> like that's never going to happen because it hasn't happened on anything. And it definitely doesn't happen on anything that's interesting, right? It only happens in places that are not that interesting. So, um, so A, get used to it. B, though, I do think there is starting to be some clarity. And as you've seen in the press, the end of the DM project is, uh, is it, they did 
force, I think, a conversation that would have happened eventually, but maybe not on the same timetable, about exactly how do we want to think about this, and this is obviously not going away. And so I do think that stablecoin regulation is coming relatively soon. I do not believe that the that we're going to end up with a digital currency, but I do think we're going to end up with the what I call the equivalent of stable coins having access to the Fed window and functioning like a financial, a traditional financial institution, um, with all the goods and services that then spill out from from that. Um, and so we're at that fork in the road where I think it's about to turn very, very institutional very quickly. I'm sure you're observing the number of what we call traditional, you know trade five traditional finance players suddenly interested in this has skyrocketed for me the number of conversations i'm having with people that are kind of crypto 101 when i used to tell people a year ago the most important thing for you to understand is how crypto works and they would look at me in blank and now are kind of like so <laughs> like let's have that conversation um and it's become so much right so people also have to understand it's not it's so simplistic and people are still really in a very simplistic understanding of what what's going on here so um, I, I think one of the most exciting things about what DeFi has done for the crypto landscape is to push forward the evolution of crypto in a way that somewhat mimics the existing financial system. Yes. And I, you know, I I think that's both a a, a mark of things to come, but it it also uh, I, I think puts a stake in the ground to say that crypto and blockchain is not going away. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting to to hear you talk about crypto in the context of national security. I can't remember we talked about this when when I was on the board of the TVA. I try to convince the TVA, uh, given that we basically have an unlimited supply of of energy, that that we should be in the Bitcoin mining business from a mm. national security standpoint. But uh, at, at that point in time, I said Bitcoin and um, no one had any idea what I was talking about. Yeah. So that yeah. was kind of fun. Yeah. But I agree with you on the diversification. What I find I always tell people is, one, it's like any asset class you invest in, right? Which is you have to figure out um, how much you really want to learn it, right? Because you can invest in individual projects or you could, there are other you know, products and services that allow you to take baby steps into the space. Um, and uh, like anything, you got to decide. It's like investing in energy st stocks or whatever. You have to decide where, how, what, what kind of exposure you want, and how much you want, and how much you want somebody else to do it for you, in a product that gives you the access exposure without you having to make decisions and following it every single day, right? Single stocks versus mutual funds, kind of thing. So, I think it's um, it's a really, uh, but it's it's really important that people get a baseline understanding. So I'm always telling like my friends at banks and other financial services industries. Uh, industry players that you don't have to, you will end up playing in this space. You may not know it yet, but you probably will. But the most important thing to understand right now is what are your competitors doing? Where are people placing their bets? Because you need to be figuring out where in this ecosystem are our natural advantages as this evolves. That doesn't mean you have to do anything, but you do have to start watching it um, so that you, before the train has left the station, you can make some decisions on what it is you want to do. So. So you you've talked in the past about micro loans at a local level. Can can I ask you to explain what you mean by that? So um, I mean, so my thing is is what you want to be able to do at, at is is be able to have people have access to capital at at literally at a neighborhood micro level. It's it's um, literally like Grameen Bank. But have this is an access question um, that's super important for people to be able to um, live and invest and be able to build businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the um, the ecosystem today is it, it's it's not just about access to capital, but if you going back to my diplomatic lens. Um, if you go anywhere else in the world other than the G7, maybe the G20 countries, the incredible amount of economic power that can be unleashed by people, individuals having access to, to capital and credit at a really micro level um, is, is incredibly powerful and um, really changes on its head the, the entire financial system. And so I've, I'm, I've been... Uh, lots of folks who do these micro loans, we're talking loans of $50, 
right? It's it's the it's the loan that you get so that you can buy the sewing kit so that you can repair people's clothes as a side business, right? If you're at home, it's that level of loan. And all the history shows that people are willing to pay back those loans. The repayment rates are incredibly high. Um, so it's it's not that, okay, people are going to take your $50. And even if they did, what difference does it make, right? So meanwhile, you've got people taking out much longer, larger loans that default on them, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so does DeFi represent an opportunity to accelerate the micro loan ecosystem? And if yeah, so, do you, know, do you know of anyone trying to do that? Yeah, I mean, our protocol does that. We have, pub we have public pools that we just introduced that allows anybody, not just an institution, but anybody to, to basically offer um, financial products with a return to other people on the using the protocol. And so you can go on there today and trade and over time people will offer yield products and you'll be able to offer loans. And it means that you can take $100 and say, I will loan it to whoever wants to borrow it for X percent interest rate. And whoever that is in the world who needs that is willing, it can can take advantage of that. That's essentially what the whole system um, is set up to do. Um, really user agnostic and, you know, market participant agnostic. So that's in theory the vision, right? And then you're not trapped. If you're sitting in, like we forget in the United States because we have so sophisticated, sophisticated financial markets, like what do you need that for? But if you're sitting in Venezuela, if you're sitting in, you know, Zimbabwe, if you're sitting in lots of countries in the world, like that is a breath of fresh air because every morning you leave and you don't know if a loaf of bread is going to cost you, you know, 10,000 pesos or 100,000 pesos, right? So your ability to actually function and have control over your own financial freedom just isn't there. So we, I just sometimes I don't think we appreciate that because we have the luxury of having very sophisticated financial markets with lots of access points. Did you graduate in 1989? I did. So does your 1989 self have any idea as to where you are today? <laughs> yeah, no. What about you? Not at all, right? Not a fucking clue. Right. No. <laughs> yeah. Not at all. Not at all. That's the best part. That, yeah, no, you're right. That is. Every day is different. <laughs> <laughs> More adventure coming. Hey, Mona, I just am so over the moon that you took the time to talk with us. And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much for doing it. So great yeah, to have you. Do it. it was great. It was great fun. So thanks for having me. You bet. The Altogether Show is brought to you by Alto. Alto knows that achieving true portfolio diversification means investing in more than just stocks and bonds. That's why Alto developed a streamlined platform to make it easy and cost-effective to invest tax-advantaged retirement savings in alternatives, assets like real estate, venture capital, and crypto, that are outside of the public markets and available through Alto's growing list of investment partners. To learn more, visit altoira.com altogether.